Well, good evening. My name is Nairi Woods, and I'm Dean of the Blavatnik School of Government at Oxford University. It gives me particular pleasure to be moderating a debate on the question, Western liberal democracy would be wrong for China. In establishing a school of government, what's struck me is how much that question is being asked both outside in and inside out around the world. How many times in the United States and Europe I've been asked if it wouldn't be better to move to a model of authoritarian or benign dictatorship, and how many times in China and elsewhere I've been asked searching questions about democracy. So this is a truly timely debate. Um, you will be casting your vote at the end of the debate, for those of you who are coming to this as their first Intelligence Squared debate. Um, you tear your ticket in two, and you can cast your bait either for or against, depending on which of these fantastic panelists has persuaded you that their side of this argument is right. If you just want to sit on the fence, you can put your entire ticket on the in the box, but I think that's unsporting. So I'd urge you all to, to um, boldly take, make your vote. I think it's, it's also timely that we're having this debate the day after America's election. I think in the minds of many of us are questions about whether it's necessarily the case that the skills it takes to win an election are not the skills it takes to govern a country well. I think many of us are asking whether it's a good use of half a billion dollars put in by companies to purchase, some would say, their preferences in government. And that, likewise, the non-democratic systems of the world have their counterpart in the injections of billions, perhaps less transparently, into control over their leadership. I think in both West and East, there's a real issue about what is the system which best protects minorities and the very poorest in society where in one system they might have legal rights which aren't enforced, and in the other they don't have the legal rights in the first place. So these, these are the questions I'm very much hoping our debate will take us to tonight. So without further ado, I'm going to call on Zhang Weiwei as our first speaker. He's senior fellow at the Qingqiu Institute, author of The China Wave, The Rise of a Civilizational State. Zhang Weiwei will be known to many of you as the senior translator to Deng Xiaoping. But perhaps you don't realize that he spent the last 24 years, or he spent 24 years, I should say, living and working in Europe. And when I asked Zhang Weiwei why, what, what was it about Europe that he most liked, he said, it's the taste for everything old and the architecture. So Zhang Weiwei, we look forward to your argument for the motion that Western liberal democracy would be wrong for China. Uh, thank you, Professor Woods, for your very kind introduction. We are living in an extraordinary time of history. Yesterday, the US held its presidential election and tomorrow, China will hold its 18th Party Congress, which will unveil China's new generation of leaders. The Western media tends to present the two events as a sharp contrast between an opaque communist state beset with crises and a transparent, dynamic liberal democracy. Behind this very superficial contrast, is a widely held view that Western liberal democracy represents the ultimate best political system, or in Professor Fukuyama's words, the end of history. And therefore, China is viewed always as a kind of enlarged Belarus awaiting a color revolution in the transition towards liberal democracy. Short of that, China will be hopeless. But this school of thought is faced with a mind-boggling question. 
its forever pessimistic forecasts about China, China's collapse, turns to be always wrong. And after three decades misplaced predictions about China, it's time now to think outside the box, to consider seriously the scene of our debate today. Western liberal democracy would be wrong for China. To my mind, there are at least five reasons for this argument. First, common sense. With a population larger than the combined populations of North America, Europe, Russia, Japan, and more, with no tradition of liberal democracy whatsoever, with a fresh memory of the devastating breakup of the Soviet Union, Russia was only one tenth of China's size in terms of population, with long memory of upheavals throughout China's long and modern history. And China's fear of upheavals is based on common sense. Indeed, the country may well become ungovernable if it adopted Western political model. China is not an enlarged Belarus. China is a civilizational state. It's the size of roughly average 100 average European states. It's a product of hundreds of states amalgamated into one over its long history. An inaccurate analogy would be something like the ancient Roman Empire, continuing to this day as unified modern state with a centralized government, modern economy, all its diverse traditions and cultures and huge population that all speak Latin. To be frank, this kind of state cannot afford one person, one vote, a multi-party system. Even the European Union of 27 cannot afford this kind of system. If they adopt this kind of model, it will either become a useless white elephant or end up in disintegration. Second, empirical evidence. China actually experimented liberal democracy after its 1911 Republic Revolution. But this experiment turned out to be a devastating catastrophe. The country immediately plunged into chaos and civil wars, with hundreds of political parties juggling for power, with warlords fighting each other, each supported by some foreign powers, with a shattered economy and millions of lives lost in the decades to come. This kind of lesson is so sharp and so fresh in the memory of the Chinese today. Virtually, Chinese often use the word luan. They are afraid of luan. What does the luan mean in Chinese? It means chaos. And uh, third, performance. China has performed arguably better than most liberal democracies over the past three decades, especially in domains of great concern to most Chinese people. Of course, China has its share of problems. Some are very serious, but China's overall success is beyond a doubt. Over the past three decades, China has performed better than all the developing countries combined in terms of eradicating poverty. 70% of world's poverty were eradicated in China over the past 20 years. China has performed better than all the transition economies combined because China's economy increased 18-fold in a matter of three decades, compared with, say, Eastern Europe, roughly one-fold. China has also performed better than many developed countries. China has a large developed region, roughly 300 million people, uh, the size of the United States, which today, in many ways, can compete with developed countries. And the first tier cities like Shanghai in this developed region can and should be able to compete with London or New York. Fourth, the liberal democracy model itself is in deep trouble, as shown in crisis after crisis from deeply indebted America to distressed Europe. Even with Obama's election victory today, I don't see any solution to America's protracted problems. Despite some of its known strengths, liberal democracy 
as an institution has been seriously eroded by such prevailing problems, such as short-termism, single-minded populism, the excessive influence of money, especially in the United States, one dollar, one vote, and the influence of special interests. Abraham Lincoln's idea of government of the people, by the people, for the people, is hardly achievable among liberal democracies. Otherwise, Joseph Stiglitz, Nobel economics laureate, would not have complained. He said, American polity has become of the 1%, by the 1%, for the 1%. This is why even the advocate of the end of history, Professor Fukuyama, said not long ago in the Financial Times op-ed that United States democracy had little to teach China now. Fifth, and my last point, the China model, without much fanfare, Beijing has actually introduced major reform into its ways of political governance and established a very elaborate system of meritocracy, which can be called selection plus election across the whole of China's political structure. Nothing can better illustrate this meritocracy system than the lineup of the next generation of Chinese political leaders to be unveiled in the coming days. Virtually all the candidate mm -hmm. members of China's standing committee, the highest decision body, decision-making body of China, have served twice at the number one of the Chinese province. As you may know, given the size of China, each province is often four or five times of the average European states. It's by no means, it takes extraordinary talent and skill to govern a Chinese state. You have to do it twice and perform well before you get a ticket to enter into the top leadership. I said, with this kind of meritocracy system in place, as is the case now. Of course, it can be further improved, but we can already guarantee such leaders like George W. Bush or Japan's Prime Minister Noda will have no chance whatsoever to enter top-level leadership. It's way below the Chinese standards. To be frank, the China model is more about leadership while the liberal democracy model seems more about showmanship. China is now capable of planning for the next generation, while the other model planning for next election or next 100 days. China's meritocracy system indeed challenges this stereotypical dichotomy of democracy versus autocracy. From the Chinese point of view, the nature of a state, including its legitimacy, has to be defined by its substance, that is, by good governments, with competent leaders, and measured by what state can deliver, and to what extent people are satisfied. Despite its deficiencies, which could be many, the Chinese polity has ensured the world's fastest growing economy over three decades running, and ensure the vast improved living standards for most Chinese. As revealed in the most recent PW survey, PW the Washington-based research organization, 82% Chinese feel optimistic about the future of their country. Indeed, this statistic is so good, it's way ahead of all the Western liberal democracies. Winston Churchill's famous dictum, democracy is the worst form of government except for those other forms that have been tried, may be true in the Western political culture. Many Chinese even paraphrase this phrase into what Chinese call xia xia or least bad option. But in China's own political culture, in Confucian tradition of meritocracy, a state should always strive for the best of the best solution and option. It's by no means easy, but you have to try. Even you meet half of these standards, which is already admirable. So at this moment, China has succeeded in building up, although it's not perfect yet, 
this kind of meritocracy system will combine the best option of selecting well-tested leaders and also introduce the least bad option to ensure the exit of bad leaders through collective leadership, through terms, very strict term limit, age limit. So I think this kind of meritocracy is really uh, competitive. It may win out in this global competition of ideas and uh, good governance and good democracy. China has learned so much from the West and will continue to do so for its own benefit. But it may be time now to use Deng Xiaoping's famous phrase, to emancipate the mind and learn a bit on the part of the West, to learn a bit more about China and even learn a bit from the Chinese ideas and practices, however extraneous they may appear for its own benefit. In conclusion, one man's medicine could be another man's poison. And Western liberal democracy may be great or less great for the West, but would be miserably wrong for a country like China. Thank you very much for your attention. Our next speaker speaking against the motion is the former Chief Secretary of Hong Kong, the first woman and the first Chinese to hold this second highest governmental position in Hong Kong. Anson Chan is someone who learned her politics at home. She and her twin sister and six brothers contending and with a remarkable woman as a mother, a mother who was widowed in her mid-30s and raised the eight children as well as carving herself out a career as a famous calligraphist and painter. We're lucky to have Anson Chan here today. Thank you, Anne. Thank you. I'd like to thank Intelligence Squared for inviting me to participate in this debate, addressing the motion that Western liberal democracy would be bad for China. I think the selection of today's date could not be more apt, neatly sandwiched between yesterday's US presidential election and tomorrow's opening of the 18th National Congress of the Communist Party of China that will usher in the next generation of Chinese leadership. The contrast between the nail-biting finish of one with the carefully choreographed outcome of the other could hardly be more stark. I'd like to begin by addressing the subtext to the motion, namely that the Chinese model of government has done more for the Chinese than the Western model of government ever could. This rather presupposes that within this room, we share a common understanding of what is meant by the Chinese model of government and the term Western liberal democracy. As I doubt this is so, Permit me to give my perspective. 63 years on from the end of the civil war in China, the Communist Party still remains firmly in control. However, the policies of the last 30 years, in particular the evolution of capitalism with Chinese characteristics, have moved light years away from the ideologies of the Mao era, which thrived on constant social and economic turmoil and led, amongst other things, to the disasters of the Great Leap Forward and the Cultural Revolution, during which millions died. The key characteristics of the current Chinese model of government would seem to me to be an ever-growing bureaucracy intent on preserving at all costs one-party rule, recognition that this can only be achieved if the population at large believes the economic benefits being reaped outweigh the fact that they have no say in the selection of those who govern them. An economy that is still largely command-led, structured around successive five-year plans supported by huge government investment in state-controlled enterprises and infrastructure. Vigorous suppression of dissent through strict censorship 
and harassment persecution of any who dare to speak out against the system or its injustices, and subordination of the rights of the individual to the wider public interest as determined by the state. Set against this are what I see as the typical characteristics of a Western liberal democracy. Recognition of the essential role of political parties as channels for the expression of differing views within society and a basis for orderly change of government from time to time. Bias towards a predominantly market-led economy in which the government's priorities are to nurture innovation, support free enterprise, and ensure that the needs of vulnerable sectors of the community are met. Absolute commitment to the rule of law, freedom of thought and expression, protection of individual rights and freedoms within a just and fair society. There is no doubt that the Chinese model of government, however described, has delivered extremely impressive economic growth, lifting many millions out of poverty, and in the meantime, greatly enriching some. But the speed and scale of China's development is not exactly unprecedented in more democratic societies. Look at the rise of Great Britain as a global economic power in the second half of the 19th century, or the emergence of the United States from the Great Depression of the 1930s to become the most prosperous and powerful nation in the world. Conversely, in the latter part of the 20th century, the Soviet Union's socialist model of centrally controlled economic development, which China initially sought to emulate, collapsed, unable to fend off demands for political reform from within or compete effectively with the faster-growing market-driven economies of the West. To argue that Western liberal democracy would be bad for China is, in my view, an insult to the Chinese people. It implies that they are somehow not sufficiently grown up to aspire to electing their own leaders, as opposed to having them foisted upon them by means of a highly opaque process of balancing the various factions within the governing elite. Furthermore, anyone who argues that Western liberal democracy would be bad for China must also be prepared to acknowledge the perils that the nation faces if it doesn't begin to take some genuine steps in the direction of political reform. All around the world, previously unshakable authoritarian regimes are being challenged and overthrown. No wonder China is keeping a nervous eye on developments in North Africa and the Middle East. It took the self-immolation of just one persecuted street vendor to trigger revolution in Tunisia. In Tibet and Sichuan, the tally of self-immolations has risen to nearly 60 since 2009 and shows no sign of abating. The current Chinese model of government is founded on the belief that as long as the economy keeps growing and standards of living rising, stability can be maintained and the population at large will tolerate, amongst other things, an ever-widening wealth gap between the cities and countryside, restriction of personal rights and freedoms, and the continuing crushing of any form of dissent. This strategy, in my view, is fundamentally flawed. The current form of government is under challenge from a rising tide, not just of discontent, but real anger among sectors of the population that are increasingly disaffected. No one knows exactly how many incidents of popular unrest, commonly referred to as mass incidents, are occurring. Some estimates put it at 180,000 in 2011, whilst others believe that this is just the tip of the iceberg. Little wonder that China is now spending more on internal security than on the funding of its military. Popular anger and increasingly bold resistance to government authorities is being fueled by forced land acquisitions, arbitrary land grabs by provincial officials, often to make way for totally unnecessary development, empty high-rises and shopping malls, roads to nowhere. 
The collapse of shoddily constructed schools in the 2008 Sichuan earthquake, tainted baby milk and other food safety scandals, environmental degradation have led and are leading to unprecedented confrontations between ordinary citizens and the government. Still, all too often, instead of acknowledging shortcomings and responding to justified concerns, the authorities' reaction is to punish the protesters for disturbing social harmony. Corruption is now rife at every level of the Chinese political machine. Power is concentrated in the hands of a privileged clique, perhaps no more than 400 families, who are bound by a common purpose to protect their mutual vested interests and capacity for self-enrichment. The communist vision of proletarian supremacy within an egalitarian state has been subsumed by greed and injustice, exemplified by the often shameless flaunting by party cadres of ill-gotten wealth and a culture of impunity from moral and even criminal culpability. No one wants to see China go the way of the Soviet Union in the aftermath of its disintegration. The gains that China has made in the past three decades are far too precious to put at risk. In an age when the dissemination of information via the internet and the blogosphere is unstoppable, to continue to try and stifle dissatisfaction and dissent is about as futile as King Canute's legendary attempt to stop the tide coming in. Current abuses of power and the pervading lack of transparency and accountability simply will not be tolerated indefinitely. Everywhere in the world, the need for change is the mantra. Rather than waiting for popular unrest to force change, China's leaders should now be actively planning for an orderly relaxation of its iron grip on political power and a move towards greater openness and participatory politics. My conclusion, the central government needs a new model that it can nail its colors to. Back in the late 1970s and early 1980s, Hong Kong played a crucial role in kickstarting China's economic revolution. Under Deng Xiaoping's open door policy, special economic zones were established on the border with or in close proximity to Hong Kong, with the express purpose of inducing Hong Kong industrialists to move their manufacturing operations across the border, where land and labor were so much cheaper. This marked the start of how southern China morphed into the factory of the world, piggy banking on Hong Kong investment that provided employment for millions of migrant workers and provided the formula to attract wider foreign investment. The Hong Kong economic model clearly worked. And I believe that the Chinese central government can and should look to Hong Kong to test a new model of more democratic government that could be extended progressively into the mainland. Thanks to the terms of the Sino-British -Joint Joint Declaration and the concept of one country, two systems enshrined in our constitution, the basic law, Hong Kong people enjoy the fundamental freedoms associated with a modern liberal democracy, namely the rule of law and an independent judiciary, freedom of expression including freedom of the press, freedom of religion, freedom from arbitrary arrest and imprisonment, zero tolerance of corruption, the promise, not yet realized, of the right to elect our head of government and legislature by means of universal suffrage. Far from being bad for China, it is essential that the coming leadership in Beijing begin to draw up a blueprint for reform that provides Chinese people through a process of evolution, not revolution, with the fundamental rights and freedoms associated with liberal democratic government. There are plenty of studies to confirm the link between rising levels of economic well-being and the openness of the political system. A democratically-based system of governance will not only sustain China's long-term economic growth, but will also enrich Chinese society and the world at large. And the perils of not doing so are becoming increasingly acute. 
So, ladies and gentlemen, I beg to oppose the motion before you this evening. Thank you. So, our next speaker, um, speaking for the motion, is Martin Jakes. Martin is author of the book, When China Rules the World, a senior research fellow at the LSE and a visiting professor at Tsinghua University in Beijing. He tells me his fascination with China began on a holiday in southern China in 1993, where, from the sounds of it, he fell in love with both a country and a woman at the same time. In about 30 seconds, he told me. Martin. I'd like, to, I'd hasten to add it wasn't 15 seconds, it was th 30 seconds, it was 15 minutes. And it didn't happen in China, it happened in Malaysia. <laughs> and my wife to be was not Chinese, but of Indian descent, Indian Malaysia. <laughs> so apart from a few inaccuracies, it was accurate. <laughs> now, I want to clarify, first of all, what this motion is about, or what it's not about, is probably the best way of putting it. This is not a proposal that liberal Western-style democracy will always be inappropriate for China. I don't know what the situation is going to be like in 25 years or 50 years. I don't even know what the situation is likely to be in the West in that period. What we're discussing is something much more specific. Likewise, we're not suggesting, or certainly I'm not suggesting, and the motion is not suggesting, that what happens in China and the arrangements that are, uh, that are appropriate for China in this period should be transplanted into our own societies. I would not argue that for a moment. In fact, on the contrary, I would say that the reason Western democracies have grown up in the West has been because of the history and the culture of our societies. And we need to pay due respect, I would suggest, to China and the differences of its history and culture in the same way. What this motion is about is a country which is a developing country, which in the middle of the 20th century was extremely poor, which had suffered 200 years, during a 200 year period of more or less, and I mean this literally, economic stagnation. Its GDP at the end of this period was more or less the same as it was in the first part of the 19th century. And it had been invaded and partially colonized by many countries, including our own. In 1949, China was a mess and a basket case. And the task that confronted China was how, with this vast country, could they transform it? And they made quite a few false moves and false starts. So when Deng Xiaoping came to power in 1978, he identified the two crucial tasks, tasks of China. The first was an overwhelming focus on the need for economic growth, and secondly, intimately tied to that, was the need for a huge reduction in poverty in a poverty-stricken country. At that time in 1978, the Chinese economy was 1 20th of the size of the American economy. And since that move from the end of the 70s in the direction of economic reform, we have seen the most remarkable economic transformation in human history. A population of 1.3 billion people, one-fifth of humanity, its economy growing at 10% a year, to the point where, today, the Chinese economy 
is half the size of the American economy. And there's a general view now that the Chinese economy will overtake the American economy in size around about 2018. This is truly remarkable. And I want to correct you, Anson, because it's just not true that the British experience or the American experience of industrialization in any way compares with the Chinese achievement. The British Industrial Revolution between 1780 and 1830, which was the key period, or you can push it to 1840, the growth rate was around about, on average, 1.5% a year. 1.5% a year. And that was a population of, what, 20, 30 million at that time, probably more like 20 million at that time. Or take America, you mentioned America. Well, the period between the end of the Civil War, the mid-1860s, to 1914, the American growth rate never exceeded, on average, something like 3.5%. And that, of course, again, was a much smaller population. So that is why I suggest that this is the most remarkable economic transformation there has ever been. And it has been presided over by the Chinese government. And it has lifted, I mean, just, let's remember this as well. If you look at the reduction in global poverty over the last 30 years, China is, overwhel is responsible for the overwhelming bulk of that reduction in poverty. If you take China out of the equation, actually the global performance has been very disappointing. Now, I challenge the view that this does not, the Chinese government does not enjoy the support of overwhelming mass of Chinese people. I don't know, you know, if you look at, for example, the Pew Global Attitude Surveys, uh, the uh, support for the Chinese government is, is extraordinarily impressive. If you look at Tony Sage's work uh, from the Harvard Kennedy School uh, in terms of the levels of satisfaction amongst the Chinese in terms of their government, you know, the ratings are extremely high indeed. And is it so surprising? If your living standards are growing, as they have been now for a while, at roughly the same pace of economic growth, 10% a year, then, you know, it's quite likely that your, popu your population is going to be uh, rather pleased uh, with, uh, with government. And I challenge the idea also that, you know, the political... Uh, of course, there are many things that are different from what we're used to, which we would certainly object to. But the idea that the sort of political atmosphere, the political environment is frozen is a mistake. I mean, the idea that, every, you know, you said dissent is crushed. Excuse me, I mean, there are about 150,000 mass, mass incidents every year in China in which people, uh, which mainly consists of farmers objecting to what they regard to be the illicit seizure of their land by local government, flogging it off to, uh, to, 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 to property developers. And these actions are well, uh, you know, they're reported in lots of places and they take place and it's not true that they're all suppressed. And sometimes when there is suppression, like in Wukan, actually the authorities are forced to retreat or take the wave of strikes in Guangdong province and in, uh, along the eastern coast in Shanghai in, two, uh, in 2010 and 2011. Tens and tens of thousands of people on strike. And they were not suppressed. They were allowed to happen. And the result, huge wage increases. The minimum wage in Beijing was increased uh, during that period by 30%, Shanghai roughly similar, and so on. Huge lift in living standards. So it's not good enough, right, to be frank, to paint China as this sort of autocracy with a central government which suppresses everything. There has been a huge shift in the personal freedoms of the average Chinese since the death of Mao. You've only got to go to Shanghai or to Guangzhou or to Chengdu and you can see it on the streets. And it's not true that everything is censored. Actually, the censorship in China is much lighter than it used to be, much lighter. And the access to information, sure, there are controls on the internet, but quite frankly, if you want to, you can get around them. So this is a society which is throbbing, actually, and it's vibrating with debate, contrary to the picture that Anson has presented, which is a very common picture presented 
uh, to uh, Western uh, audiences. Um, I wanted to just say something else, you see. My concentration in what I want to say is really about China as a developing country. Now, let's take a comparative example, India. In 1950, which has got, in many ways, a, a most impressive democracy, in 1950, the Chinese economy and the Indian economy were more or less the same size. Today, the Chinese economy is four times the size of the Indian economy. Why? Because the economic strategy pursued by the Chinese has been far more successful than the strategy which has been employed by India. And India has a great problem. It's got a most impressive democracy, which is what we celebrate, and an extremely corrupt and inefficient state which cannot deliver. In other words, in that sense, it's opposite to China. And the poverty reduction in China has been far, uh, anyone who goes to China and go, goes to India can see this, has been far more successful uh, than anything that has been achieved uh, in India. Now, I think also we need a bit of humility about this. China is a huge, as Weiwei pointed out, a huge country on a scale that is unimaginable to us in the West. So we, and we, its task has been how to, it has been an industrial revolution, essentially, economic takeoff, as Rostow described it, the shift from the countryside to industry. Uh, around the time of uh, Deng Xiaoping, it was not much more than 20% of the population lived in the urban centers. Today, it's 50%. Now, what was the situation politically, excuse me, in the West, in Europe, in the United States, when we were having our industrial revolutions? How many Western countries were democracies at the time of their industrial revolutions? Shall I tell you how many? Zero. Zero. In uh, Britain, uh, uh, in, in 1850, uh, finally, one-fifth of men had the right to vote. That was after the conclusion of the Industrial Revolution. And it was not until the 1880s that most men had the vote, but not women. Or take America. It was not until 1860 that most white men gained the vote, but not blacks really until the 1960s and women in 1920. And if you look at Europe, exactly the same pattern. Their industrial revolutions were accomplished essentially in France, in Germany, in Italy, and so on, before uh, they had democracy. So when, so when we say they should be like us, well, actually, we should, speak, we should speak with more modesty because we weren't like what we want them to be um, uh, uh, during uh, this particular historical phase. I would like to conclude by just saying this. First of all, I would ask our, my, my country to be more modest and more humble in the face of China's extraordinary achievement and not think our task is to say, why the hell can't you be like us? But on the contrary, I think what we need with the rise of China is a much more humble attitude which recognizes res and respects their achievement and also is willing to learn from them. And what we're going to face, I think, now is not just feeling that democracy is important, but also we need to learn from the Chinese about state competence. This is not a subject that's been discussed in the West, but it will be discussed in the West. And here we have much to learn from the Chinese. Thank you very much. So our next speaker speaking against the motion is Jonathan Mursky, a historian of China in 1989 named International Reporter of the Year for his coverage of the Tiananmen Uprising by British, that was the award by British newspapers. 
Jonathan's interest in China, um, he's explained to me, goes right back from his parents, who lived in Beijing in the 1930s, working in the Peking University Medical Colleges. Jonathan, it's a pleasure to have you at the debate. I feel very uneasy about going on about this because I think Anson, as I just wrote a note to her, gave the very best talk on what democracy and civil rights are really all about that I've ever heard in my life. I think my friend Roger Garside may be here. Did you put your hand up? Are you here, Roger? Yes, there he is. He wrote a book a long time ago after Mao's death called Coming Alive in Peking when he was in the, it was just after he'd been in the British Embassy there. It was about Democracy Wall, as it was called, and the man who had been the great star at Democracy Wall was Wei Jingsheng, who went to jail for 15 years thereafter for what was called um, sedition. So I'm not here to say that the American or the British model of democracy is the best or even a model. I'm certainly not going to say what Martin Jake said, that we have to learn that a bad, a bad model of democracy is Italy. But we could think about Iceland or Sweden or Norway. Now, what I really have in mind is this. For four years, when I was in a kind of second stage of learning about China, I lived in China. And uh, there was a very brutal dictator in charge. He had a terrifying wife. There were a lot of political prisoners. There was no free press. It was really very scary if you were a Chinese. Then that dictator died, and before long, his son took over, and that place is now a democracy. That's Taiwan. It's full of Chinese who wanted really what in fact uh, had been denied to them for uh, many years. And after that, I worked in China for many years, and over and over again in Tiananmen and in lots of other times and places in China. Uh, I saw the Chinese, the need of many Chinese, as they expressed, for these models of a kind of democracy, a free press that's not stifled, that can say what it's like, and can even be pornographic and wrong and li libelous and scabrous, uh, that there should be free speech, that aside from, again, from slander, and things of that kind, and racist remarks, that there should be free speech, that there should be freedom of assembly, that people can get together in groups. In fact, it's what, it's what Obama said last night in his speech, that what you see in America is the argument for political change, impossible in China today, but a good thing. Uh, regular elections that people know are going to happen, you might get a terrible leader, you might get a good one. You, you can't be sure, but at least people can get rid of a government or they know it'll go away after a while. And above all, the rule of law, something really predictable. And then I think, is it just, it's a thing I was thinking about in the cab coming over here, a real education. So that if you meet young Chinese who are the elite who are here at the LSC or at Oxford or Cambridge, and if you say to them, what happened in Tiananmen Square in 1989? They say it was a riot and bad people shot down our army and our police. That's what they've been taught in school and there are many examples of that kind of thing. So what we see is that uh, on the Chinese internet, I just did this today to see what the words were that you, you can't get that, that are not they're not available. You can't, you can't read about Wen Jiabao, the premier, who turns out to be in a family of billionaires. The word Taiwan can't appear in the Chinese internet unless you're very good at dodging around it. Or democracy, Tibet, Dalai Lama. If you use any of those words, there can be a knock on the door and you can go inside. It's true that you can say things, you can say things in restaurants or you can say things outside and then all of a sudden something happens. So that if you're the Nobel Prize winner, Liu Xiaobo, you go into jail for about 11 years. Or Ai Weiwei, the man who helped to design the Olympic Stadium, is a man who now can't leave China. 
there is no real a concerted political action. If you try that, uh, as in Tiananmen, and in the 300 other cities where there were big demonstrations in the spring of 1989, if you try that, the people who have tried that concerted political action may or may not go to jail, or they may be shot down. Or what we just heard about the standing committee that's about to be unveiled, that's what's about to happen in China. They're about to have seven or nine new men, new men always. They're being unveiled. Now, I think there are 700 of you here. I wonder if there are 20 people in this room uh, who can name one name of those people who are going to be running China in, in the next 10 years. And most Chinese are the same. They have never heard of most of these people, and they will discover who they are after they've been unveiled. In law, the Chinese statement is verdict first, trial afterwards. And that happens over and over again. So that, for instance, when the wife of a man who's now also been disgraced, who was about to go on to the standing committee, Bo Xi Lai, she, she was accused of murdering the British businessman Haywood. She read out what was the charge against her. It, it all been it had all been written down for her at her trial, and then she was condemned. And as I say in education, if you ask Chinese now what they know about their own past, it's very, very little. And if you ask them what they think happened in certain great events, or what they think of the Dalai Lama, or about what goes on in Tibet, they'll give you the government line. So these are the things that I think are the big problems that free speech, some kind of community action, a free press, all of these things wouldn't change these things, but they would start to make it possible to think about changing them. The enormous gap in China between rich and poor, which is very well expressed in Mr. Jake's book. The vast official corruption, which is what the Chinese say when they're polled by Pew, uh, is, is the thing that they regard as the most important problem. The one-child system, which may be now about to be changed, which has led to a very unbalanced society, uh, in, in which there are far too many old people uh, and young people are going to have to support huge families and very, very old. Uh, I think we'll talk some more about this in the question and answer session. So what I'm not saying is that we have the model here or that we in the West have solved these problems, but these problems about corruption about the violence of the state, about the fact that Mao Zedong's portrait still hangs over Tiananmen Square. Can you imagine that happening in Germany with Hitler or in Cambodia with Pol Pot? I mean, it's really revolting, isn't it? So I think that we can discuss all this in the question and answer period. I look forward to that. I'd like to say one more thing. If I were a Chinese and I said any of the things that I've just said here to you tonight, and I said these things in China, I'd go straight to jail tomorrow and I'd be in jail for years and years and years. It's a great thing, isn't it, that we can say these things here or that my Chinese colleagues can say what they want to say here. They can say it and nothing will happen to them. If I tried saying these things and I were a Chinese in China today, I'd be, uh, tomorrow I'd be behind bars. So think about that and think how you would like it if you were a Chinese. Thanks. So that's the formal proposers for and against the motion. Let me now announce to you what your views were as you walked into the hall before the debate began. Those of you voting for the motion, that's to say those of you believing that Western liberal democracy would be wrong for China, 228. Those against the motion, 202, and those in the don't know category, which we hope will be zero at the end of the debate, 196. So there's 196 minds out there to shape, panelists. You've now got a chance to answer some of their questions. So let me open it up to you. Questions, comments. Um, if they're comments, they're gonna to have to be very brief. 
Yes, over just right in front of you, a gentleman's holding his hand up. Yep. Hi. Um, one of the key things for, that has been mentioned of the legitimacy of the Chinese government is the amount of growth in China, which is historically unprecedented. Why is China growing so fast? I'd love to understand that a bit better. Great. And next, if, if you can come up to the middle here, the lady with her hand up. Oh, I've just got a, a couple of quick comments to make. Firstly, whilst the economic growth has been unprecedented in China over the last 30 years, it seems it's becoming increasingly untenable uh, with the civil riots that have been taking place. They've increased tenfold in the last 10 years, from what I understand, to over about 150,000 per year. Surely that's a sign of growing civil unrest. And secondly, I just wanted to make a point to say that the function of the state is to serve the people. But if the people can't create consensus or participate um, with decisions of the state, then surely um, the state isn't serving the country's true interests. Thank you. Up here to the gentleman in the front. During the um, great leap forward by initiative by Mao Zedong in 1958, um, it's estimated that 38 million people died of starvation. And it seems to me that an authoritarian, authoritarian regime such as China is fundamentally ill-equipped to prevent a repetition of such a catastrophe. Thank you. I'm going to take one more question and then come to the panellists. Um, just back there, the gentleman with his hand up. Uh, if you have to make a comparison, are Chinese more like Asian Roman or Asian Greek? <laughs> Asian, Asian Roman or Asian, ancient Romans or Greeks? A, 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 Asian yeah. Greeks. Yeah. So, panelists, why is China growing so fast? Uh, I think the, the, the growth has been largely led by exports uh, and by investment, much of it increasingly state-directed investment. Uh, and I, I, I should point out that the sort of uh, double-digit growth that has been sustained in the past um, a few decades, I doubt very much whether they can be sustained in the longer run, because there is a cost, there is a price to be paid for this type of growth, and you need also to look at the quality of growth. What the, the uh, strong growth has resulted in is that uh, the leadership has not been particularly successful as they themselves wanted to, to move uh, away from export and investment to uh, consumer spending and stimulating domestic demand. They have not succeeded in this. Um, the, the fixed income investment in 2011 was equivalent to 50% of GDP. That, now, that is not a particularly efficient use of resources. And the growth has resulted in overcapacity, particularly in infrastructure and in property. It has, as I pointed out, led to growing income disparity, to very serious environmental degradation. And these are the costs that future generations of Chinese will have to pay. Martin? Well, that wasn't the question, was it? I thought the question was, why has China been growing so quickly? Yes. And I, I think that's a very uh, apposite question. And it's not so simple to give you the answer. I mean, I think there, are all, there must be a whole cluster of reasons for it. There's not just one or two. Uh, first of all, I think that uh, there was clearly uh, enormous pent-up possibility in China. I mean, China historically, uh, until the beginning of, you know, until the mid-19th uh, century and the Opium Wars and so on, China had been a remarkably successful economy. I mean, in 1800, it had a, uh, an av average living standards on a par with Northwest Europe, and before that, it had a living standards much higher, and it was a much more developed economy. So clearly, within the Chinese historical experience was a great potential and possibility. Secondly, I think that the, 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 what uh, uh, they began to do was to learn. 
to learn not just from the West, but to learn from, and not just Hong Kong either, but to learn from East Asia. I mean, the most remarkable successful economies in this period were in East Asia, like Korea, like Taiwan, and so on. And uh, I think the Chinese, and uh, during this period, learned a great deal. Thirdly, the state, under Deng Xiaoping, was, remar was remarkably pragmatic in his approach. Remarkably pragmatic very pragmatic and very non-ideological. which uh, And this was the new example, and it's set to, to, for the Chinese, and that's how I think many, many, many Chinese, including many young people you meet today, are very, very pragmatic and are fantastically good uh, learners, and I think this is what China's been. And my last point for the now would be to just say there is a, there, the Chinese don't go on about a China model, but it does have two, I think, particular characteristics which are most unusual. One is uh, a enormous commitment to the market, a ferocious market. Um, I mean, Adam Smith writing in uh, the late 18th century said, the Chinese market is far more developed than anything we've ever seen in Europe or that we have in Europe. But that is combined with an extraordinary state. It's a ubiquitous state. It has, it, and this is not just in the communist period, this is the, a long Chinese tradition running back into the imperial, the, through the imperial uh, period. And the Chinese state takes on responsibilities uh, which are much, much wider than is, any, than is true of our own tradition. And is historically, not just now, historically an extremely competent institution. So I think that is, a particular paradigm that we're going to be exploring for a long time to come. Thank you, Martin. Wei Wei, 38 million died of starvation. I mean, the work of Amartya Sen and Jean Dres tells us that that doesn't happen when you've got democracy. Well, uh, in the first place, Great Leap Forward was a tragedy, and everyone in China knew about this. But what's important was actually the person who drew more lesson than others was none other than Deng Xiaoping. Yeah. He drew so much lesson that he began this gigantic reform, which put this into an, a kind of never will happen again. So when we talk about this length of growth, speed of growth, it's important that the Chinese state competence, to put it, give an example, we have a plan 70 years St started in 1970 to 2050. Yeah. And within this 70 year plan, five year plan, five year plan, this kind of strategic planning creates tremendous what I call long term demand, unprecedented in human history. So in China, if you look at the growth of people's wealth, it's a revolution. Yeah. I just, well, I, with all respect to Madame Chen, you know, I was in Hong Kong first time three decades ago, full of admiration. But today you went to Hong Kong, any Chinese, huh? if you, you find in the housing condition was so poor compared with most Chinese living in the cities. You know. Just an example to show that. And um, uh, this issue concerning, uh, yeah. Oh, sorry. Ah. <laughs> I should be closer. And also, Thank by you. the way, concerning this famine, uh, it's also happened uh, during the British colonialism. Huh? You have a, a, a potato famine island. Mm -hmm. You have a Bangalore famine in British India. Uh, when tens of population died, so uh, each country perhaps has some ugly part of its history. We have to be honest with that. The problem is whether you can deal with it. Yeah, now China has succeeded in dealing with that. We can export. And uh, now, concern this uh, allegedly how many rights and China uh, is uh, somehow uh, unstable. Actually, I don't worry about this at all. You know, in the first place, I don't know exactly how accurate this figure is. But what's more important is, the again, shows our argument concerning civilization or state. Uh, in Chinese, we have a saying from its long history, uh, we're opposed to the local corrupt officials, but not the emperor. You know. So all these so-called 100,000 cases, 99% happen in the very grassroots, in the village, whatever. And uh, they are not challenging the central government. Even provincial government is sufficient to pacify the situation. 
So this is a very, very not, not big issue. I think I'm less, I'm more concerned with British summer rights rather than this one. Indeed, you know. And um, uh, yeah, yeah. I think uh, China has found its own model of development, which is very effective, which is broadly supported within China. I think, along with this model, along this coming party congress, we can expect within a decade, China's economy will be larger than the U.S. economy. And furthermore, what's more important, it's highly likely by that time, 10 years from now, China's real middle class, I mean, economic standards, decent job, plus a property, will be twice of the American population, which means 600 million people. Thank you, Wei Wei. Uh, Jonathan Mursky, Romans or Greeks? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, am I in the right hole? <laughs> <laughs> I, I'd like to answer your question. I'd like to answer your question about what happened. I mean, why so fast? I'll just give you one little brief fact. Uh, take a look at a recently published book by a Chinese woman called uh, Pai Xiaohong. It's called Shelf of Sand. She estimates that 45% of China's GDP is the work of displaced peasants who are working in China cities with no rights at all, no medical treatment, no education. So these are hardly the recognized citizens of China. So do, do if you'd like to check that out, do. Uh, as for, uh, uh, here's, here's another possibility. Uh, if China, if the peasants of China were so advanced, as in some sense they were in the 18th and 19th century, what did Deng Xiaoping do? He got out of their way. He didn't do anything, he just let them produce. And that's what Zhao Ziyang, a man who was originally, who was in the end was put under house arrest by Deng, he pointed out that in the province where he was the party secretary, that the peasants were taking their land back and that uh, their production was going way up. So the Chinese who are no more or less hardworking than anyone else have simply, when they've been given the chance, have produced a lot. And the rightless Chinese, those people from the farms who first went down to the failing factories in the south and now work in the cities with no rights are the people who have produced a lot of the GDP. Um, Thank you, and I'm going to I think that's enough. I didn't understand what you meant about Greece and Rome, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> we'll come back to that. Um, more questions. So I'm, if you can come over to this side now, we've been biased to this side, up to the front, sorry. I'm interested, uh, Martin Jakes, you said that um, perhaps at some point in the near or distant future, China might be right for democracy. Um, what, what changes would have to happen um, and what really would represent the, the tipping element for that? Great, and if you can pass to the man behind you with the orange sweater. Uh, Anson Chen, I assume you reached your powerful position without being voted in by a single Hong Kong uh, resident. Why do you think uh, the UK thought it was wrong uh, for Hong Kong to have liberal democracy? Even the last governor, Chris Patton, was imposed upon you. Was that a mistake? Can you repeat the second part of your of question? It's, it's why... So why? the, question, the yeah. question was, why did Britain think that it was wrong for Hong Kong to have direct democracy? But we'll come, back, we'll come to the answers in a moment. Okay. Further questions, so at the, the hand in the middle of this block here. Yes. Right across. We've heard a lot about being by, for, and of the people. But China, as the speakers have clearly shown, is a nation for the people, as we can see by the huge amount of people that have been lifted out of poverty. But America, a nation supposedly founded on being by, for, and of the people, we've just seen an election funded almost entirely by special interest groups, ranging from big oil, the NRA, rich and evangelical Christians, uh, and, the, and they're funding radical candidates, which they can choose, and where both of the candidates attended the same university. So how, I ask you, is that by, for, and of the people, in any sense, more than, it is, more than the Chinese are? 
Thank you. And any further questions? I'm looking at the, towards the back of the hall so that you're not disempowered by geography. <laughs> <laughs> but um, thank you. Yep. Is Tibet today what Czechoslovakia was in 1938? And if China continues to grow, are we going to receive the treatment which is currently being meted out to the Tibetans? So, is Tibet today what Czechoslovakia was in 1938? Was that last question. And we'll take one more question, just down here. I'll come to you in the next lot. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, I respect what the others have said, but it seems to me the only person who's tried to argue the motion is Zhang Weiwei. The others have merely made comments about China which I wholly respect. And I think the core of Zhang Weiwei's argument is that China is so big and so diverse that mass political parties wouldn't work. And that seems to be the key distinction because nobody denies that there should be more rule of law, less corruption, more of a free press, etc., etc. I don't suppose Zhang Weiwei denies that at all. The key distinction is mass political parties and I think Wei, Zhang Weiwei has argued that they just wouldn't work. Have I grasped it correctly? Thank you. So let's, let's take the first and last questions together. Is China too big for democracy? And what changes are necessary for China to be ripe for democracy, which was aimed at, at Martin? Who would like to jump in? OK. <laughs> I think my name is Martin. <laughs> um, I challenge that. <laughs> I must say, what a contrary chair you are. Um, well, uh, I, I'm uh, absolutely sure that over time, China, as it has been over the last 30 years, will become more open, more transparent, more representative, more accountable. And as the population uh, you know, was for so long obviously focused on basically survival and then, you know, trying to get a better living standards in situation of poverty. As, it, as its living standards uh, uh, greatly improve and lifestyle improves, they're faced with a range of choices uh, and that will influence the whole culture and the politics of China. The question is, mm. this is the question, what will it look like? Will that Will that take the form of what, we're, what we call Western-style democracy, or will it take some other form? And I, I really don't know the answer to no, But the question that was put to you was, what are the changes necessary for China to be ripe for democracy, well, just whatever kind of democracy I, that is? That, what should we look... Excuse what, me, that's exactly what I've just been talking about. <laughs> so, what, so what will those changes be? In, in well, uh, well, well, they are, we they, they are, they are about rising living standards mm -hmm. and the transformation of people's lives and conditions and possibilities and choices and opportunities. Mm -hmm. So I, I do subscribe to the view that as China becomes more prosperous, then pressures for, for greater democratization will greatly increase. Now, um, what the, 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 you, are, you asked another question, which is what will it, it be like? What will, those, what will a Chinese democracy be like? And I, um, I think that you know, factors like what Weiwei's been talking about, which is the sheer size of China and the diversity of China, uh, um, uh, uh, play here. Because actually, no sub-global system, which in a way is what China is, has been a democracy. You know, the European Union isn't a democracy. Um, so size is a, is a serious factor, not necessarily a compelling factor, but it is a serious factor in relationship to it. Now, the other point I want to make is this. There's no tradition in China of popular sovereignty. There never has been. Likewise, by the way, there's not really a serious tradition of popular sovereignty in Japan. Japan, in my view, has a bolt-on Western-style democracy, but actually what really happens is uh, state sovereignty which is accepted in Japan and China. It's a Confucian tradition. And uh, so Japan is really run by its state bureaucracy. 
although it appears to be like a Western-style democracy. And I think it's quite possible that, you know, what will happen in China will be that there will be all sorts of new forms of expression and popular expression and so on. But because Chinese history, because of the way Chinese see it, state sovereignty will still, in large measure, lie at the heart of whatever China becomes. I just want to say one other thing. Great, question, thing. great question on Hong Kong. And the fascinating paradox is that it'll be in 2017, it looks as if the chief executive will be elected by the Hong Kong population, which is something that the British did not achieve in 150 years. Um, yes, absolutely. Um, so, Anson Chan, would you like to respond? Okay, uh, yes, first I'd like to ask Martin a question. Uh, if and when China is ready for democracy, does he also envisage the disintegration of the one-party system rule? It's and if so, when? Well, I don't, I don't know when. Uh, it, it, it is a possibility. I mean, nothing is forever. Nothing is eternal. So but with respect, that is not the motion before us. The motion actually says Western liberal democracy would be bad for China. It doesn't put a time frame. Well, Nobody I, is advocating a quantum leap at the moment. What we're saying, what I'm saying at least, is that there should be an evolutionary process to democracy as there was in Hong Kong. And you mentioned that in the year 2017, Hong Kong will have universal suffrage. I think that remains very much to be seen. I doubt very much whether there will be genuine one man, one vote, but I would be delighted to be proven wrong. Could and I? Can I answer that question? Yeah. I think it depends on what you mean by democracy. Hmm? I don't think democracy centers just on one man, one vote. Hmm? I'm willing to concede that at this stage, maybe one man, one vote is a little too early. But there are the other aspects of democracy which I believe to be important for all nation and for all human beings. And that is human dignity, some basic rights and freedoms, the right to participate in the governance, to improve the quality of governance, to have some say in issues that affect their everyday life, to have the rule of law, not the rule of men, not rule by law, and to have an independent judiciary that is not subject to the dictates of the one-party system rule. Now, I, I, I agree with Martin that in the th three, 30 years since opened our policy, there has been phenomenal economic growth, there has been a degree of personal freedom and social mobility. But the sad fact is that in recent years, market economy reforms have stalled, and the government has backtracked on legal reforms. All judicial organs in China are now subject to the dictates of the one-party system rule. Do we seriously think that the population, that the 1.3 billion people in mainland China are content to accept this? You say that there are mass support for the one-party system rule. Why is it then that we get people in, from mainland coming to Hong Kong to participate in demonstration, particularly against the blind dissident, Li Wangyang, who was alleged to have committed suicide? And Sun Chan, could you, could you answer the question? I, I, will, I will gladly answer the question. First of all, I'd like to point out I was not a politician, therefore I was not elected. I was a civil servant, and I was elected, I, I was appointed as a result of a series of competitive examinations. I like to think that the recruitment board recruited me because they saw some potential in me. I did not owe my appointment nor my subsequent promotion to political patronage. And, and after I retired, I was democratically elected. I did participate in a, a by-election to the Legislative Council, and I won. Wait, wait. Well, I will say a few words on this issue of one-party system. You know, I think indeed to understand China, perhaps we have to move a bit away from our own European experience or whatsoever Western experience. If you have to apply this concept one party, I can say, you know, over the past 2,200 years, 99% of the time, China was under one party rule. 
Yeah. Except we had tried Republican and, uh, revolution, and then the country degenerated into chaos and civil wars. And of this 2,200 years, China was indeed way ahead of Europe for 1,700 years. We missed the Industrial Revolution, and then we became backward. When over the past three decades, China indeed catching up very fast. So the Chinese one party, this party has nothing to do with the Conservative Party, Labour Party. It's a continuation of the old tradition in China, what we call the unified state, Confucian state. At the center of the Chinese state, it's always a unified political entity based on meritocracy. Officials were selected for thousands of years passing competitive exams. And uh, further from that, uh, Wait, wait, can, can, can yeah. I pick up the question yeah. that, the, that two of the audience okay. put to you? Which, so your argument was, yeah. as they understood it, was that China is too big for democracy. Mm -hmm. And your debating partner's argument is that China is not yet ripe for democracy. What's your view? Is it that it's too big and not ripe, or that uh, it's... Well, I'll answer both. First, it's simply too big, too diverse. Actually, to practice Western-style democracy, it's a suicidal for China country will break up overnight. Yeah. We had experience, they will not try this again. To be honest, you ask 10 Chinese, nine will tell you, it's unbelievable, unimaginable. China will have so-called modern parties, that every four years you change the central government. It's 1.3, 1.4 billion people. Right? It's, it's, uh, it's no joke, you have to go through a gradual process. Actually, I'm not thinking you know, China is really moving towards Western-style democracy. That's mm -hmm. not the right word. Mm -hmm. We are very confident. We can compete with the West in political system. I'm writing an article which hopefully will appear in New York Times in the coming days called the Meritocracy versus Democracy, China May Win. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this meritocracy is wonderful. We had this for thousands of years. And we really draw a lot from European experience. So we call it meritocracy, and in bracket, selection plus election. It functions very well. Thank you. Um, any panelists willing to give us 30 seconds on Tibet? Is Tibet today what Czechoslovakia was in 1938? Do I have any takers? Jonathan, perhaps this is aimed at you. Am I giving you the hardest questions, Jonathan? No, no, I've been to Tibet six times. Uh, the Chinese tried very hard, the Chinese occupation tried very hard to smash Tibet Buddhism and the way of life. It hasn't worked. It hasn't worked. Uh, that's why Tibetans are setting themselves on fire. Um, in all the times that I was in Tibet, if you got to know a Tibetan a little bit, he'd take a picture of the Dalai Lama out of his pocket and kiss it or press it to his head. So just that alone is one of those things that if I were a Chinese, I would feel ashamed of myself about. But that's not really what I want to say at the, the moment. What I'd like to say is this. It's enough to make anybody weep to think that it has now been forgotten that in 19, 1989 in Tiananmen, there were hundreds of thousands of people in Tiananmen and in 300 other Chinese cities. And what were they saying? Da da Deng Xiaoping, da Deng Xiaoping, smash Deng Xiaoping, Li Peng, the premier, Xia Tai, get off. And they were shouting out for democracy. Smashed by tanks, hundreds of people were killed. Lots of people are still in jail from Tiananmen. The word is taboo on the internet. It can't be mentioned. It's deadly, and young Chinese have now bought into that because they don't know any better. The second thing is about Pew, the, um, the pollsters. In their most recent poll, what they've said is that 70% of well-educated urban Chinese admire the American system of democracy. And what did Tony Sage, who's been invoked here also at Harvard, say? in his most recent thing, I just read it today, the paternalism of the Maoist state retains a strong influence in China today. The infantilization of society is still being managed. The leadership continues to act as if it is the parent and the Chinese people are the child. Now that's what Tony Sage, who was invoked today, really thinks about what's going on in China. But it really makes me weep to think that all those Chinese who over the years desperately wanted democracy, and by that I mean freedom of speech, press, assembly, all those things which is in Liu Xiaobo to jail for 11 years, 
that that's all been wiped out. It's not that they don't want it. It's not that they're too big. Of course they want it, those who know about it. Of course they want it in the same way that anybody in this room would like to have that with all of the defects here, the defects in America, which I left because of the Vietnamese War. Despite that, the fact is that people can jump up and down, they can coalesce, they can form parties, they can write in the newspapers. Chinese cannot do that. The society would not fall apart if that happened. What would happen is that the party, which is hardly mentioned here tonight, which is called the state, the party might be hauled down. That would be a very good thing for China. Thank you. Now we're moving... <laughs> we're moving rapidly into our final straight. So, let me just remind you that you're going to soon have a little box thrust in front of you to vote. And you are all going to vote. <laughs> so you're going to take your ticket, you're going to rip it in half, and you're either going to vote for the motion or against the motion based on how much you've been persuaded by the arguments that have been put to you tonight. To assist you in that process, I'm going to ask each panelist for their two minute takeaway, the two-minute thought that they want you to leave this hall having resonating in your ears. And we're going to go in reverse order to their opening speeches. So, Jonathan. Oh, I feel I've had my say. I donate my two minutes to Anson. <laughs> wow. <laughs> she gets four minutes. Martin. Uh, well, um, my, my part... My parting thought for you is um, only adjacent to what we've been discussing, but it, because I think what we've been discussing raises a much more, much wider question, which is we don't really understand China, and we as Westerners try and uh, understand China through a Western prism, and we uh, expect our agenda uh, with regard to China uh, to be the agenda which the Chinese should follow, and we get very frustrated and impatient when that doesn't happen. And it's not going to happen because, actually, we need to understand China in its own terms. We need to understand and respect the history and culture of what is an entirely different phenomenon to anything that is encompassed by the Western experience. China, I would argue, for example, is, although it has called itself a nation state, as a result of weakness around about 1900, is not primarily a nation state. It is a civilization state. And it's a civilization st state which works in an entirely different way. The notion of identity of the Chinese is not a function of nation as it is with Westerners. It's a function in the first instance overwhelmingly of, it, of their relationship to civilization. So their sense of awareness, their sense of identity is fundamentally different. Why do, you know, why, do, why do the Chinese have such a different attitude towards Westerners to the state? The reason is because the structure of the relationship between state and society in China is profoundly different as a consequence of the fact that the Chinese feel the function of the state above all is its relationship to maintaining the unity and the well-being of Chinese civilization. So therefore, the Chinese view of the state is not like ours. We view it with a certain amount of suspicion and certainly a lot of restraint. The Chinese don't see it like that. For the Chinese, the state is the family writ large. And therefore, they see the, the state rather like the head of the family. Now, this is so different from the Western tradition. And this is our great challenge, I think, over the 21st century, because China is going to become the largest economy in the world. It's going to become hugely the most influential. Projections 2030 are that China will be responsible for one third of global GDP, where America will be responsible for roughly 70%. What's the great challenge facing Westerners for the next century? The task is to understand and make sense of China, because the world will become less and less Western, and more and more China-centric. Thank you, uh, Martin. <laughs> Anson Chan. Um, Four minutes. <laughs> no, two minutes will do. <laughs> I, I think Martin might well be right that uh, sooner rather than later, uh, China will become the largest economy in the world. 
it will have increasing uh, economic clout uh, and will seek to use its uh, so-called soft power. So against that background, all the more important that what happens within China, mm, how its people are treated, how those in power govern, mm, because they do have an impact on Hong Kong, on the rest of the world. At this stage of China's development, when we talk about democracy, as I said earlier in reply to a question, we're not saying you should move straight to multi-party system rule. We're not saying there should be one man, one vote. But we are saying that the people, Chinese people are no different from all human beings on this planet. They want human dignity, they want participation in government, they want fair, just society in which the growing economic wealth of the nation as a whole is equally shared in the same way as they are expected to share in the pain when there is an economic downturn. It is anybody's guess whether the phenomenal near average 10% growth achieved in the past three decades are going to be sustained. I rather think not. The point is that China is at a stage of development where to sustain economic growth, to achieve real social harmony, there has got to be reforms on the political side. Leaders often tout the importance of maintaining harmony. But harmony cannot be subject to the dictates of the ruling party. Harmony only comes when every individual, the masses, feel that they are fairly treated. At the moment, we see actually two classes of people. Look at the way that migrant workers who do not have hukou are treated. They don't have access to education, to a lot of other social welfare services. You have a growing income disparity, at least in the early days of the communist takeover. Those in the rural population did see a significant improvement in their standard. But in recent years, the income disparity between those in the urban areas and those in the countryside are not narrowing, they are widening. We have massive overcapacity. We, I think we have a looming difficulty over non-performing loans because there has been vast credit expansion, particularly following the Wall Street collapse in 2008. So, for the sake of all of us, I think Chinese leaders, and I hope that the new leaders coming in, will have the vision, the foresight, the courage, and the political clout to initiate political reforms in order to underpin Hong Kong and China's long-term prosperity. Thank you. Zhang Weiwei, you get the last word. You get two minutes, not four, which is what Anson Chan had, thanks to the generosity of her yeah. fellow panelists. Uh, uh, thank you. Actually, the success of China can be summarized in one remark by Deng Xiaoping, which is called Seeking Truth from Facts. It's just so common sense. You just check with any Chinese you meet in London, in Europe, in Beijing, in Shanghai, in China, in the United States. I can tell you, by my minimum estimation, 80% will say today's China is the best time in China's own history. Just common sense approach. Whatever opinion surveys you conducted, you know, even in human rights. So seek truth from facts. Even on this controversy of the freedom of the media, freedom of the press, you know, my goodness, you can press any button, check the internet, you know, you can find a hundred thousand articles criticizing Chinese government on the Chinese websites. Yeah. 
It's just a so part of the common sense. It's vibrating with internal debate on all kinds of issues. It's totally different from the past, from the time when Jonathan was in China. <laughs> now, there are alleged so-called persecution of certain dissidents. And these are really the radical of the radicals by Chinese standards. And even the Chinese approach to them is, I'm afraid, you know, it pales a lot or much in comparison with the America's persecution of WikiLeaks and Assange. No comparison. One, one final remark. In 1793, a British king sent an envoy to China and had an audience with the Chinese emperor. The Chinese emperor was so arrogant, he said China was the best. It's the end of the history, Chinese version. So China missed industrial revolution, and China began to sharp decline. Mm -hmm. West, I'm afraid, is making the same mistake. Really, I hope West will be alarmed to this fact. In this sense, I agree with Martin. Thank you. Thank you very much. The votes are being counted, but while they are being counted, we have time for a couple more comments. Now, I'm aware that we didn't get any from this corner or up the back there, so is there anyone dying to make a comment? Um, yes, there, right in front of you. Oh. Oh, I'll okay, get close to it. Um, I always get quite nervous when everyone says that China is going to carry on growing because that's exactly the kind of reasoning that had, people had behind the whole um, subprime mortgage crash. Um, China's doing very well politically when they're growing at 10%, but at some point they're going to have to combat recession or at least slow growth. I feel that if you don't, you know, if it, when people hit recession and that's when people feel they need an outlet for their anger, you're saying that 80% of people support the government. What happens when only 20% of the people support the government when they have a recession? How is the one-party government going to deal with that? That's my worry about China. Thank you. We're not going to have time for answers, but this lady here had one last comment. The question was um, addressed by An Son Chan, so it was all okay. really about um, human rights and that everybody should have the opportunity to be able to vote, to be able to pen um, the word and all the things that An San Chan has said, I agree with wholeheartedly. And I'd just like to say on behalf of the entire room that I think the debate has already been won by you. So thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and just to lengthen the suspense by 30 seconds, I'm going to give 30 <laughs> seconds to the lady here in the scarf. Thank you, Nari. Um, I think we should at least have one person from China's younger generation to speak here. Um, as a Chinese, I feel thrilled that there's an opinion that China is going to rule the century very soon, and it feels really good to be able to vote. Um, but my question is, does economic growth, or remarkable achievement, as Martin puts it, really justify the flaws in the current political system in China? And is the current political system really enables every citizen, or at least the majority of the population in China, to share the fruit of economic development? Thank you. Thank you very much. And now the debate result. Yes. So the, the good news for Martin and Weiwei is that they have persuaded one person in the room to change their mind. Oh. <laughs> Voting for the motion were 229 people. You'll recall there were 228 before you came in. Now. Voting against the motion, persuaded by Anson Chan and Jonathan Mursky, 362. That's a, that's a lot of swing voters and a lot of committed voters <laughs> swinging. And the result I, as chair, am most thrilled about is that only 24 people 
decided that they didn't know. So a but huge thank you. We know who you are. We know, to, you are. We know where well, you live, and we're going to come and get you later. You undecided. <laughs> so thank you.